if you have a Bible with you, Romans 14. If you're new, we've been going through the book of Romans for almost a year now, and we are in chapter 14 this week. The topic is where we were last week on Christian liberty, if you're taking notes, and sort of the facet of that conversation on Christian liberty is no trip hazards. In other words, don't put a stumbling block in front of your brother. Uh, I want to start by just reading the first verse because it has a transition from the last text to this new text. So we'll just read that verse and then we'll pray together. This is Romans 14 verse 13. Therefore, Paul writes, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Why don't we pray together? Father, we come before you this morning as your gathered people to worship you, to behold your wonderful ways and works, uh, both in creation and in salvation And in the way that you're working in this church, God, we are so grateful for you. And and this morning, as we come to your word, as we often pray, we we don't want to leave this place the same people that walked in. We want to be a little bit more transformed into the image of your son, Jesus, than we were when we walked in. We want our minds to be just that much more renewed by your truth and by your spirit and and by our time together as a transformed community that is meant to transform one another by your spirit. And so God, we pray to these ends that you would glorify yourself by transforming your people as we are here today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, last week, just as a little recap, we started this kind of a three-part mini-series on Christian liberties, and this discussion is located in the second part of Paul's letter to the Romans. The first part is chapters 1 through 11, which has to deal with theology and all that God has done for us in Christ. Chapters 12 on has to deal with what that all means for us in our day-to-day lives. How does the, how does the gospel transform us as Christians and renew our minds? How does it change our everyday experiences? How does it change the way, we relate, way, uh, the way we relate to ourselves, to the world around us, and to church relationships? And as we saw last week, Paul introduced his readers to the ever-present reality that whenever Christians get together, or people in general, but Christians as well, there are differences of opinions and perspectives, and some of them are critically important, and others really aren't worth time arguing over. In fact, I talked about this last week, there are usually three-tiered theological, uh, a three-tiered theological triage that must take place when considering the importance of such opinions or distinctions. I mentioned last week that in that first tier, these are the essential beliefs that everyone must agree on in order to be an authentic Christian? Like, do they believe in the triune God? Do they believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation? Those kinds of things. In the second tier, there are important church matters that genuine Christians can agree to disagree on. Like, for example, modes and methods of baptism or communion or church leadership. These are important matters, And people can disagree on them, but we can still call one another Christian. But there are also third-tier issues, and those are the things that exist in what you usually call the gray area, meaning there is not a clear description or prescription in Scripture that tells us what we should or should not do with that discussion. And we are left to discern those things on our own through basic wisdom of Scripture, common sense, and this ultimate imperative which is to love others over ourselves. Now, last week, Paul introduced us to the fact that in any church, there tends to be two kinds of people that are navigating through these issues that sort of meet the pole, right? And and 
And these two groups need to find common ground in their relationship with one another. On the one hand, Paul tells us, there are people whose consciences, he says, are weak, meaning they're, they're young Christians or they're naive Christians, and, and they haven't fully grasped the implications of their freedom in Christ regarding those things that really don't matter all that much. The most common cause for this occurrence, in, at least in Paul's day, was past traditions and experiences before coming to faith in Christ that now they've come to faith in Jesus, but they're having trouble letting go of some of those past traditions and experiences or seeing them in a new way through their new relationship with Jesus. And because of that, Paul says, their consciences prohibit them from practicing certain things as they see as immoral or unwise to do. And to this group, as we saw last week, Paul just simply tells them, hey, as you're learning these things and growing, the one thing you need to understand is don't judge people. Don't judge people. Now, in the church, there can be some who think that it's their spiritual gift to judge their brothers and sisters, but there is no such spiritual gift since God alone judges all people. He himself will judge the world in the end. This is the group we talked about, again, mostly last week. But there is a second group, and these are those, Paul says, have a strong conscience, meaning their conscience has matured to the point that they are able to do or not do certain things, knowing that those things in and of themselves don't possess any spiritual significance this side of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And I'm going to sidebar for a moment and talk about the conscience. You see, the conscience is that thing we all know of as the great God-given guide and, and feature of, that every human possesses that allows us to reason in our minds and enables us to comprehend moral absolutes, helps us to know right from wrong, good from bad. The conscience is like a compass, and it points us in the right direction. It enables us to see the wrong direction. However, because of sin, the human conscience is broken. And, and though it, it still has that magnetic pull, right? It wants to pull us in, in one direction. It doesn't always point us in the godly direction. But there is a solution to this problem. And the solution is faith in the gospel. The recalibration of our consciences happens through the teaching of Scripture. And the more that we saturate our minds with the truth of Scripture will we be able to do, as Paul said back in the beginning of chapter 12, discern the will of God, what is right and true and good for our lives. But if we expose our consciences to immoral things, we can also sear the conscience. And it, a great illustration would be like tuning a guitar, right? Every week, Cody has to tune the guitar string because that's what guitar strings do. They go out of tune, our consciences as well go out of tune because of the exposure from the world, and we constantly have to come back and recalibrate it to the right key and the right note and the right pitch, and we do that when we come to the Word of God. With that said, it is to this second group, those who, are, who consider themselves to be mature in their faith, that Paul is going to talk to directly in this section. Maybe that's some of you. I hope that your ears are open and listening, and the point and you'll see this be, as the, the text that we're about to read. The point that Paul is making in this section is this. So this is the central truth. Christian maturity is not revealed, it's not expressed by flaunting what you can do, but in your loving consideration of those around you as people more significant than yourself. Another way, for those whose consciences are strong, it is our Christian responsibility to not just think of our own liberties in Christ, but the feelings and experiences of those who are still working these matters out in their own life and in their own faith. So I want you to keep that as the central truth in your mind as we read this passage together. We'll read verse 13 down to the end of the chapter together. Paul writes, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, 
but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Now, I'm sure most of you, as you surveyed that, noticed in the text that Paul is talking a lot about food and drink because that was the cause of disagreement and division in the church. And we talked about this last week, that there were Jewish Christians, okay, people who were coming out of Judaism religious legalism, basically, and they were, they were Christians. They were kicked out of Rome. Remember, there, this was the historical context. Was Among the Jews, there was infighting about, was Jesus really the Messiah? Of course, the Christians were saying yes. The Jews were saying no, and there was so much arguing that the emperor kicked them out of Rome. Well, now 15 years later, they're able to come back, and they're joining their former churches. But many of them we're still practicing the traditions and laws of the Old Testament that were done away with at the coming of Christ. Because let's be honest, old habits die hard. And this was significant, a part of their identity as the people of God. And the reason is because they had not yet brought those practices that mostly had to do with dietary restrictions and the observance of spiritual holidays. They had not brought those yet under the lordship of Jesus. And as we come to this section, we see that Paul speaks not to them, but to those, the mature group, who were receiving them. And, and he hasn't left the discussion on food, because again, that's, that's the point, but in one sense, it's a metaphor for us, right? Because we can replace that with all kinds of issues that we divide over in our day and in our culture. Now, again, for some of them, dietary restrictions, they were not a big deal, but for others, it was central, central who they were. The alarms were going off. But notice what Paul says there in verse 14. He says, in Jesus, he is persuaded that nothing is unclean. And he repeats himself again in verse 20. Everything is indeed clean, meaning there isn't a food, there isn't a holiday that is spiritually unclean in and of itself. Now, what does Paul mean, or what does Paul base this belief on, since he was a Jew, and and he's talking to his fellow Jews, and they feel otherwise, what does he base this on? That he's saying nothing in and of itself, no food is unclean. Well, I'll give you two reasons. First, he has a good theology of creation. Paul knows that in the beginning, when God made everything, he made everything good. Everything was perfect. The only reason why it became unclean was because mankind screwed it all up. Jesus himself remarked on this reality in Mark 7. He called the people to him, this is what it says in verse 14, to hear, and he said, hear me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside of a person that by going into him that can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside 
cannot defile him since it enters not into his heart but his stomach and is expelled. And then parenthetically, this is what the author's footnote, he says, he declared all foods clean. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile the person. So what he's saying is the, the food that you're eating, there's, there's nothing intrinsically evil about it, but if you equate it to be evil, then it is evil toward you, but you're the one that's making it that way, not God. Everything is clean. So again, Paul's theology of creation understands that when God made the world, he made everything good, but it was man who perverted it. Second, Paul's theology of redemption enforces his thinking on this point. Remember last week I mentioned that story in the book of Acts. Peter is struggling how to uh, initiate the Gentiles into the church, and what is the relationship there, and and God gives Peter this vision, and, and it's a, a tablecloth coming down, and there's all these animals that were off limits for a Jew to eat. And, and the Lord says to him, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, which is a hilarious move. You're going to tell God, no, I can't do this. It's against my religion. I'm paraphrasing. It's against my religion. But God said, do not call unclean what I have made clean, which was essentially to say, through the redeeming work of Christ, what once was foreshadowed in the past that was observed through these dietary restrictions and holidays has now been fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And when he came, he came to inaugurate the kingdom of God on earth in order that we might enjoy his creation in the beauty of righteousness and redemption. But, and this is a really big but, <laughs> though Paul himself understood that these external things, they don't possess in and of themselves any intrinsic evil to make a person unclean and separate them from God, he also acknowledges the fragility and the importance of another person's conscience. In other words, though they may now have the ability to do something with a clean conscience before God, it's not all about their liberties. Instead, it's about your spiritual maturity that's tested by your ability to put others above yourself in these non-essential matters. And in these non-essential matters, Paul says to them, listen, I agree with you. These are all clean. They've been made clean by God. There's nothing, if you do those things, that, that are going to separate you from God in and of themselves. But you must consider, if you think you're a mature Christian, you must consider not just what you can do, but the consciences and the feelings and the opinions of your weaker brother or sister above your own. And if you don't, God's not going to hold you accountable for, for participating in activity. He's going to hold you accountable for your improper treatment of your brother and sister, your fellow Christian. And on that point, he says this, don't put a stumbling block or a hindrance in front of your brother that causes them to stumble in their faith. Now, this idea of the stumbling block, we have to admit, it's a very Christianese term, right? It's a very churchy word to say. And because of that, it's a little cliche and maybe has lost its meaning. So let's talk about it for a minute. What does Paul mean by this? Well, the phrase, a stumbling block, originates in the Old Testament. There was actually a law that God had to give to his people that said, do not put a stone or, or a rock or an object in front of a blind person to make them stumble. Could you imagine how cruel that is? He had to actually make a law that said, do not cause a blind person to stumble, but this became, that was a real law in, in history, it became sort of a, a metaphor and expression for spiritual things as well. And we see the term come up again in Luke 17. Jesus uses it, but in an ultimate sense. He said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were 
were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin or stumble, another way to translate that word. Now, the way Jesus uses this word is, is again in the ultimate sense, and it's in a different sense that Paul is using it here, but it's the same illustration. Don't put before someone a trap that causes them to stumble or sin against God and stumble in their faith. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, at least those of you who have read more of the Bible, doesn't Paul say somewhere else that the gospel itself is a stumbling block? So are we not to, supposed to put any stumbling block in front of somebody? Because the gospel itself is a stumbling block. And in fact, he does say that in 1 Corinthians. He says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So what's the difference in the expression? Well, I'll explain. In Jesus' use of the word or the term, he is addressing those who put a barrier in front of people from hearing and believing in the gospel. And I think when we think about people like this, we think about people who try to debunk, they write books trying to debunk the authenticity or authority of the Bible. We think of politicians who won't allow Christians to assemble and gather together to worship. But, but that's not what Jesus has in mind. Jesus actually has in mind people who put rules and law in front of grace. Those who say, before you believe in Jesus, you have to do X, Y, and Z, or else he won't accept you. You see, the invitation of Jesus is this, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What Jesus is referring to there is there are people who have put burdens, spiritual burdens, moralistic burdens on top of people, and he's saying, I'm ready to remove all of that off. Anyone who knowingly or unknowingly hinders someone from coming to Jesus just the way they are by adding works to faith or religion and morality to the gospel of grace is in serious danger before God. This is what Jesus means by that statement. Things like, we see this in the, in, in the New Testament, where they taught that you must become a Jew in order to be saved. Or we've seen in other uh, cultures and churches that you must be baptized or you must go through these steps in order to have assurance of salvation or else God won't accept you. Those are the kinds of things that Jesus has in mind. Again, closing that point, those who put a barrier in front of those receiving Christ are the ones Jesus is talking about. But there's a good kind of stumbling block, which is the one Paul brings up in 1 Corinthians. It's the stumbling block of the gospel. And here is Paul's point. The Jews were offended by the gospel. Why? Because of their pride and their ego. When Paul writes in Romans 14 to not put a stumbling block in front of their brothers, he isn't saying don't put the gospel in front of your brothers and sisters. We should do that every week. Every Sunday we want to remind each other that it's only through the life and death of and resurrection of Jesus, that we have salvation, that we have purpose and meaning in this life. We want to present the gospel before one another every day. Instead, every Christian must understand that the gospel has two effects. Whenever it is taught, whenever it is proclaimed, the gospel has two effects. In the positive sense, it breaks down our pride, and it shatters our ego, and causes us to see, I have an intense need, and Jesus can meet that need, and he is my only hope. And we stumble over that because we're just going about our daily lives, thinking about ourselves, and then all of a sudden we come face to face with Jesus like Paul did on the road to Damascus, and his life was never the same. That's what he's talking about. Now, in the negative sense, the gospel does something similar. It also crushes the ego, but it does so to the point where people say, I'm going to hold on to this, though. I am not going to accept Jesus in fact, he is a threat to me and to my pride and to my ego, and they push him away. And th this is the dual nature of the gospel. It's a stumbling block to those who don't want to believe, but to those who believe it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. This is Jesus' point in Luke 20. 
that everyone who falls on this stone, that stone, talking about himself, will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Friends, whenever you tell people that Jesus is the only way, you're going to offend people. You're going to offend them. Paul isn't saying here in Romans, don't offend anybody. That would be impossible if you were to be faithful to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Now, of course, we understand the stumbling stone of the gospel, though, is not us unnecessarily or unintentionally or personally offending somebody, right? They're offended by God. They're offended by Him, and it's God's message that is offensive to them. And so we're not offending them personally, but we are sharing the message with them. And He wants them to stumble over that gospel in hopes that they would consider it and believe and repent of their sin. Unfortunately, though, there are many, and we know, who don't share the gospel for fear of offending somebody because they like to be liked. And all anyone can say to that is, we need to get over ourselves and think about the eternal destiny of those if we don't share. But again, Paul isn't talking about putting a stumbling block in front of people hearing the gospel, and he isn't talking about stumbling over the gospel itself. So what's he talking about? He's talking about not relationally offending people unnecessarily. Now, we must understand, we cannot please everybody, right? We know that. We can't please everybody, and Paul isn't asking his readers to do that. There are times when you will say and do things that have no intention of offending anyone. Nevertheless, people get offended. This is how it works on social media, right? You post a picture, you and your friends hey, wow, I had a great day today, and then all the other people are like, how come I didn't get the invite? I, I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> it, I'm just posting a picture of, of me and my friends out at lunch. I, I, I didn't mean to not invite you, okay? I didn't mean to offend you, but people get offended all the time. And I think this is especially true with people here in the Pacific Northwest. Now, coming here, people have asked me, what are some of the cultural things you've noticed that are, that's different? And, and I would say people in the Pacific Northwest are, are easily offended. And I'm sorry if I've offended you by making that <laughs> statement, maybe proving my point. But it's true, and it's a part of the culture, and I understand that, and it's important to understand that and not be dismissive of that, but instead to think, wow, I, I really don't want to offend people unnecessarily. No, instead, what Paul has in mind here is that those who claim to be mature Christians, the evidence of that is not in what they can do concerning their own consciences, but how tenderly and selflessly they consider the faith and the conscience of their weaker brothers and sisters, newer Christians, younger disciples in the faith. Paul calls his readers to not indulge, but to walk in love in verse 15, and to pursue, not expressing my liberties, but pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding in verse 19. You see, there are some Christians, and we know, that like to masquerade their liberties in hopes of showing, I don't know, how mature they think they are, Look at me, I can do all this as a Christian because I'm free in Jesus. I can celebrate Halloween and not feel guilty about it, right? I'm just kidding, that's just a dumb example. But you know what Paul would say to that person? You're actually not mature at all. You're, you're very naive and, and arrogant even. Yes, you can do those things, but you don't need to masquerade around just to show others how mature you are. The moment you have to do that, you show how immature you really are. That's not the marks of a kingdom citizen, is what Paul would say. The kingdom isn't about personal indulgence, right? It's not about food and drink, but righteousness, right living between us and God and us and our fellow brother and sister. It's about peace, shalom within the family, and it's about joy in the Holy Spirit. Look at what he writes there in verse 22. The faith you have, don't post it all over social media or let everybody know and argue about the fellowship hall. Keep it in yourself and God. If you have the liberty to do that and these non-essential issues, do it. You don't need to, in other words, you don't need to convert the already converted in Christ over to your opinions on third-tier issues. 
whether it's politics or culture or music or whatever, whatever, whatever. You don't need to convert those people over to your opinion. Instead, in verse 14, what does he say? Welcome your weaker brother. In, in chapter, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 1 of chapter 14, he says, welcome your brother, but not to quarrel over opinions. I see people do this with theology too. People want to debate eschatology or the nature of the kingdom or the order of salvation or the relationship between Christ and culture. And, and trust me, we should have opinions about these things, but it isn't my mission or, or your mission or our church's mission to convert everybody on the first day we meet them on, on what these opinions are. In fact, I, I know that for some people, these, these issues, though they may not be a big deal for some of you, they, they can be really sensitive for others, and we need to tread lightly and considerately. People who grow up in legalistic homes, they tend to be sensitive in, in certain areas, in conversations. People who grew up tasting the poisonous waters of the world, they're, they're sensitive about other areas. And, and we who are mature in faith need to consider the walks that people have in their life, the stories they have, the testimonies they have, they led them to Christ, and where they're at now in their journey, primarily on this basis, because they're our brothers, and they are our sisters, they are our spiritual family, and it is our responsibility to look after them and see them grow in their faith. On, on that point, there's this great little book called The Bruise Read, and it's written by a, an old Puritan named Richard Sibbs. And, and the idea with the bruised reed is that people are like a bruised reed. We're like a, a piece of grass. And you've seen a piece of grass that gets stepped on and, and it wants to come back up with the sun, but it's, it's kind of broken, right? That's what he's saying people are like. All, every day we're interacting with people who are broken. And, and we're like grass, right? We, we fade with, with the passing of time and, and the wind. And he's saying people are like that and we need to be considerate and caring of these people, and he says this, there's a great quote in the book. He says, it is a good strife among Christians. One, to labor to give no offense, and the other, to labor to take none. The best men are severe to themselves, tender to others. In other words, if there's one thing we should be striving for as Christians in how we relate to one another in the church, it should be to work hard at conscientiously not unnecessarily offending somebody by considering their feelings and their opinions, and at the same time working hard not to take offense when none is intended in your direction at all. Now, of course, all of this is so much easier the more you grow in relationships with other people, right? Someone offends you, but probably the reason why is because you really don't have a relationship with them. If you knew them, you would understand where they're coming from. And the same thing, you, you unnecessarily offend somebody, it's, it's probably because you don't really know them, and you need to get to know them, and then once you hear their story, you're like, man, I, I really shouldn't have said that. I, I didn't realize that you had that experience, right? So getting to know one another relationally, this is where that can happen. Can you imagine being a part of a church where people thought, I, I don't want to unnecessarily offend anybody, and, and if I do, I'm going to be quick to apologize, and at the same time, people who said, you know what, I'm not going to take everything so personally all the time and be so easily offended. But again, the emphasis in this text is on the actions of the mature concerning their weaker brother. And he says, don't put a stumbling block in front of them. Why? Well, Paul tells them, because they're hindering what God's doing in their lives. This is what he writes in verse 20. You're getting in God's way when you do that. I don't know about you, but I don't want to get in God's way in the way he's working in people's lives. Now, understand, Paul doesn't mean that we can take someone's salvation away. What he's saying is that we can seriously injure somebody spiritually in their conscience or in their feelings to the point that they are hindered for a great season of time in their growth. How many people do we know today who say they don't go to church because the church hurt them? Lots of people. Now we also know that people use that as an excuse, right? And we also know that people are hurt not because someone actually hurt them but because they didn't get their way and so they took their ball and went home, right? Right? 
But excusing those, those more shallow reasons, there are truly people who have been hurt by people who did not consider their weaker brother and their consciences. And it's our duty, motivated by love, to not give offense unnecessarily. And again, if we do, to be quick, quick to apologize. And again, to not get so easily offended in these matters of indifference. Now I understand, as we're coming to a close here, there's a lot of detail that I skipped. And, and I wanted to give more weight to this central truth of what Paul is actually arguing here. And, and if you want some of that other info, you can listen to our podcast this week. That's a shameless plug. For now, I think we can just commit, commit to consider the experiences and the feelings of others above our own in these non-essential issues, knowing that what matters most is not the issue, it's not our ability to uh, live the lives the way we want to live the lives, but it's the relationships, right, that we have. What good is it if we win the argument but lose the relationship? Everyone in this room, those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus belong to Jesus. He has saved us all and is working in us all for his purposes, for our good through faith and by his grace alone. And we are the family and we need to be there for one another. And there are still those who are on the journey and we, the church, are to be the witnesses of that transforming power of the gospel in unifying people from different places of life where you would look at this group and say, what brings these people together? I don't know, nothing outside of what Jesus has done for them. Why don't we pray and then we'll have a time of communion together. God, we come before you and I think as we think about this subject, I, I think the simple thing would be to confess how often we fail in both of these areas. We who think we are mature often unintentionally offend by not considering the experiences and the uh, opinions of our fellow brothers and sisters, and, and we want to apologize for those things and, and be transformed by you and be truly mature and think about them and, and less about ourselves. And, and at the same time, we recognize that we can be so easily offended and take things so personally when it has nothing to do with us. And, and I, I pray, Lord, that you would forgive us in that as well and, and that you would help us, as, as Richard Sibbs talked about, that we would work hard at at not giving offense and not taking offense. Help us to be that kind of church that thinks more about the relationships that we have through our faith in you than in our petty differences. And, and I pray, Lord, that the world would see that transformed community and stumble over that good gospel that we've all stumbled over and, and been saved by, and they too would be saved. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.